those of you that have listened, thank you very much for your attention. It would be nice to know if any of the viewers have treated somebody with these forms of dysplasia and sharing your experience with us would, would be really great. You can contact the, the folks at Oasis and uh, we'll try to get some information and packages together. Um, and, and on another note, if there are any other sort of issues that you would like a presentations on that you think might be beneficial to hear if you're having a problem with something or other, it would be good to get some sort of feedback. So thank you very much for your continued attention. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to CDA Oasis. I'm Shiraz Gesayer. I welcome Dr. Tom Shackleton and Dr. Paul Belziki to speak about a very interesting clinical case that Dr. Belziki encountered. And uh, here they are. So welcome and the floor is yours, gentlemen. Hello, Tom. Uh, this is Paul from Toronto. Nice to talk to you this morning. Uh, just as an interesting case that I saw, and it was a bit of a, a learning situation for me, and I thought it might be advantageous for others to partake in it. So this is a, a female. She's in her 30s of African descent. She called me during the whole COVID thing when we were locked down and she said, my teeth are bothering me. Can I come see you? And I said, yeah. So she came in and she said her lower teeth just felt, if not sore, some sort of an awareness. And she felt that they were, they were mobile. And indeed, um, as you can see, they are both upper and lower are proclined. She has, I believe what's called bimaxillary protrusion. And uh, the teeth, her lower teeth just felt odd. So I took, and that's from the, the lingual. So I did say, take some radiographs and I saw this appearance of abnormal bone. So as <laughs> back in school, I got straight A's in pathology and that was some 40 years ago. And I really could not remember all the finer nuances of all the different types of osseocemental dysplasias that may be at play here. So I fired this off to a colleague here at Sunnybrook Hospital, an oral pathologist, and he says it's one of the uh, osseofibrous or fibro-osseous dysplasias. And there's not much you can do. Just try not to get the area infected because people just don't do well with infection in these areas. Don't try to extract teeth. Don't do endo. Just try to, to leave it alone. Keep it as clean as possible. And I, I, we never touched on ortho. He just warned me, you know, this isn't endo, this isn't perio, just leave it alone. Uh, well, that much I knew and, and I thanked him for it. I told the patient. Now she came back in September when things quieted down and started up again. And she said, I really do not like the look of my teeth. So I don't do ortho, I don't want to do ortho but I sent it to an orthodontic uh, classmate of mine. Uh, and she went there, saw a young associate. And the next thing I knew there was a treatment plan on the table to do orthodontics, extractions and orthognathic surgery. So in lieu of what I had heard from my oral pathology colleague, I thought I better phone, phone the office and speak to the orthodontist. And I did, and it was a, a young, younger orthodontist. She'd been out about five years. And I said, you have an extensive treatment plan for this lady. Did you see the radiographs, the periapicals? Did you see the, these periapicals that I sent? Does that raise a red flag? And she said, oh yeah, I kind of saw that. I don't think it's a big issue. We'll just send her for an endo consult. And if he signs off on it, we'll start ortho. And I said, really, do, do you not think that there's, you have to worry about, about what's going on here? And she said, no, we'll just get it signed off and we're good to go, quote unquote. Uh, my classmate who owns the office, unfortunately was away for a few months because of a, an injury. And uh, I, called, I called another 
oral pathologist that I know of, and I sent them this radiograph, and I said, what do you think about ortho in an instance like this? And he sent me this article uh, saying, with these sorts of dysplasias, it's a contraindication for orthodontic treatment. So at this point, I did call my, my classmate. He was aware that ortho is contraindicated and treatment plans got changed where she can now just have some sort of retention uh, for those lower teeth in the hopes that uh, a tongue thrust problem isn't forcing them more anteriorly and some sort of other removable retention appliance. And I got other articles sent to me. Some of these are from 2009, 2008, reviewing this. So I tried to educate myself on this. And it was at this point when I did send you this material, Tom, mm -hmm. and we thought that this would be a good case as a learning moment for clinicians that aren't aware of this situation. Right. And I, I think this highlights quite a few things. I think uh, uh, the importance of radiographs, but also not relying entirely on radiographs when we diagnose cases. Uh, I mean, if one were to look at an image like this, it would be easy to convince yourself, oh, there's some endopathology. We'll do endo without testing the teeth. So I think it certainly highlights, I mean, it's an unusual look for sure. It's not your classic, you know, periapical lesions you see with an abscessed or infected tooth, but just the importance of getting a history and doing proper testing and, you know, just be thorough, right? So, uh, but in terms of orthodontics, I think the issue that someone would run into in a case like this is those, those teeth just I mean, this condition, so florid osseous, cemento osseous dysplasia, or even if it's a focal um, periapical cemento osseous dysplasia, um, I mean, the, there's going to be loss of the apical PDL, and that's pretty important if you want to move teeth. And you get these big chunks of this fibrosseous um, tissue that will really prevent the movement of the teeth. So although there's not really much literature that talks about the consequences of orthodontic movement, uh, but just because no controlled studies have been done that I'm aware of, I mean, perhaps there are, but I, I haven't found any uh, of, you know, trying to move people's teeth or not move people's teeth or how do you move their teeth, but they probably just won't really respond well. And the concern would be, will you actually make the condition worse? Uh, as you mentioned, your pathologist friend said, look, just make sure you know, you don't do anything to traumatize these teeth. And I think the concern would be you take something right now that's a stable condition that otherwise really isn't causing this one too much, too many problems. And, and then you start trying to move the teeth and perhaps some of those orthodontic forces uh, do end up introducing some problems. Uh, also, as an orthodont, I mean, I'm no orthodontist, I don't move teeth, but I understand they're going to try to balance forces appropriately. Uh, well, they're, they're going to lose that ability in a situation like this. So it'll just become obviously unpredictable when you have no apical periodontal ligament. So I, I think you made the right call, quite frankly, and, and uh, talking to that orthodontist and just you know putting the brakes on extensive treatment, especially if they were going to remove teeth, uh, because that could lead to obviously some further complications that can be difficult to manage. How do, how do these folks handle infection if you do have to extract or if, it, if there is an infection in the area? I was told that the blood supply now in this bone is aberrant or compromised such that you can end up with an osseonecrosis. Yeah, and that's the concern. So if if somebody did need to have a tooth removed because you know they're still teeth and they're still prone to decay and uh, infection things like that. So if if something does have to be removed, that is the concern, which is why I wouldn't remove one myself. I would send them to a surgeon because they might require some ongoing care and management and and some further surgical management. So that is certainly the concern. For those of you that are watching, I did take 
at the request of the second orthodontist, I did take periapicals of the upper teeth. And there's hints of something going on in these areas as well. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the lower, lower sixes on both sides, just a little wisp of, of some changes going on there that might also be red flags to try to do as little as possible. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's pretty extensive too. So again, if this person's going to try to have orthodontic movement, it's, uh, and you see it really so generalized like this or florid, um, not a whole lot of movements likely to happen. Um, is there any other and I asked this of my ortho, my pathologist, one of the pathologists here in Toronto. I asked them if there's any other investigation that's warranted, not so much we're doing ortho or dental work, but systemically, are, are there any other tests? Are there any other things that, that you would want to make the patient aware of in case they go to a physician for some other complaint to say, look, I have this ongoing thing. It can't, you can't have cranial facial lesions elsewhere. Is there other investigations worth doing or you just treat all of this sort of thing symptomatically? Like does a physician need to be aware this is in place in case there are other findings or other systemic findings somewhere else? Uh, typically this, as far as I know, tends to be uh, limited to the jaws. This is not, because it tends to only reside in alveolar bone. You don't tend to see it in the body of the mandible. So uh, it tends to just be more of a, of a tooth related condition. So again, I'm not aware of any systemic conditions. There is some talk about possible relationship with uh, something like neurofibromatosis, but uh, you know, in the absence of any overt uh, lesions or anything like that, I, you know, I, I don't know of any further investigations that I'd recommend. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your expertise. Yeah, thanks for including me. I appreciate it. Always good to see you. Good to see you too. Bye-bye.